Welcome everyone to this third interview for Flambeau Noir, the International Left Hand Path Conference 2017. Today I have with me the esteemed Dr. Thomas Carlson, uh, all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, hi, Mr. Uh, Thomas. Could you uh, uh, hi. <laughs> could you uh, give us a brief yep. uh, a brief introduction on um, on some of your work and what you do? Uh, I think uh, the reason uh, why I'm invited uh, to uh, Flambeau Noir, which uh, I'm very happy for, is uh, that I'm founder of the international uh, left-hand path uh, order, uh, Dragon Rouge, which I founded uh, when I was uh, quite young, and uh, we have been around now for uh, uh, more than 25 years. Um, I also uh, study esotericism as an academic, so uh, I try to balance these uh, two uh, aspects of uh, esotericism, the practical initiatory esotericism, which uh, is uh, uh, my main mission in Dragon Rouge, but uh, also uh, academic and studies at the universities uh, to, to see the history of, of uh, magical practices, uh, alchemy, tabala, and um, and uh, how it has been practiced uh, through the ages uh, to give us uh, knowledge of, of uh, the historical background uh, even for, for uh, contemporary movements. Right. Good. So then let's just uh, get right into that then. Um, so um, how do you describe some of the defining features of the left-hand path? Um, like what is it? What are some of its characteristics and how do you compare it uh, to the right-hand path? Uh, that's a very good question. And sometimes uh, when I go to uh, my mundane work, I meet uh, old friends from schools, you know, back in the days, and they come to me, oh, Thomas, uh, haven't you found uh, the, uh, an occult order, Dragon Rouge or something? And I say, yes, yes, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's uh, not that we, we must spread the word. Uh, it's, uh, uh, more like an inner uh, quest rather than something that we should uh, tell everyone to do. And then I often get the, the next question, but it's something with the left hand path, right? And um, I honestly say, of course, yes, it's left hand path, but what's left hand path? And uh, it could be on the subway, uh, on the metro. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, oh my God. <laughs> uh, it's impossible to define in a simple way and that uh, one of the most important uh, things with the left hand path it shouldn't be easy to define because it is uh, a path into realities that's beyond words which is also the reason why uh, Dragon Rouge uh, uh, chose to have a symbol uh, as a center of uh, uh, the organization uh, or order rather than uh, one specific culture. We could have named it like the order of Loki or the, the order of uh, yeah, some deity. Right. But uh, um, from the very beginning we thought that the left hand path is uh, a kind of meta concept that's beyond any human uh, uh, culture or tradition. And, uh, and uh, we can see some patterns. It's possible, maybe, to do some uh, definitions of what uh, the left hand path could be. But at the same time, uh, left hand path always uh, uh, goes away from, from uh, easy definitions. But there are some points I think it's common for all left hand path systems. Uh, emphasizing the dark, of course. Right. The dark uh, deities of different traditions, uh, while the right hand path uh, usually turn to the to the more common light, so to speak, uh, deities. So, if in uh, Nordic tradition, uh, right hand path systems are more focused on seed and tradition and uh, and the gods like Thor, we can see in the Nordic tradition that it's more focused from the left hand path perspective to heal to uh, uh, the children of Loki, to uh, German Gander, uh, Fenrir, uh, the dark uh, goddess, etc. Yeah. 
And in the biblical tradition, of course, it is uh, the bad boys of the, the <laughs> and girls also of the biblical tradition, like Lucifer, Lilith, Leviathan, Satan, and so on. One uh, also important thing that has been highlighted, uh, for example, uh, Sina and Niklas Schreck in their uh, very good book, uh, Demons of the Flesh, is that uh, there uh, have always been, or there seems to have always been, a correlation between the left hand path and the uh, feminine aspects uh, of, of spirituality. And uh, not all kinds of feminine aspects, but the dark and sometimes aggressive forces of the feminine, as we can see, for example, in, in, uh, in uh, a goddess like uh, the Indian Kali. Right. Good. Um, so with that, um, you have quite a few books. You've made, I would say, a career w uh, in the occult. Um, so you have um, a few projects coming out this year, such as uh, the fourth edition of Kabbalah, Cliffoth, and Goetic Magic um, in its English transla translation. Right. Um, it just came out in its, is it Spanish or Portuguese? Uh, both. <laughs> oh, both. Okay. And, and as well as French, yes, um, which I'm looking forward to, to getting. <laughs> um, and, then, and, and then also you're working on um, the second edition to Uthark, Night, Night Side of the Ruins. Um, That's correct. Yeah. So do you have, um, or can you give the viewers um, uh, some descriptions of these two really excellent books? I've read both of them. Um, and give some, some details on kind of what it is and maybe what they might find that would be new in the, the new editions. When it comes to Uthark, um, it starts to be so much uh, changes in the book and so much new material. So I've not decided yet if it will be a, a, a new revised edition or if it turns out to be a new book. Okay. Uh, that could uh, be a, a good complement uh, or complementary to, to Uthark, Night Side of the Runes. Right. But basically, the concept of Uthark is uh, to uh, continue the ideas uh, created or, or discovered, uh, depending on perspective, by uh, the Swedish professor Sigurd Agrell who meant that the, the secret of the runes uh, become um, uh, apparent if you, you uh, take the first rune uh, of the, so to speak, exoteric uh, rune row and put it in the end, and then uh, you can see how this could correspond to, to um, other uh, ancient mystery cults such as the Mitra cult, uh, the Greek initiatory mystery cults, and he compare then the runes uh, with the, with the initiatory cults uh, from from classic time. Okay, and um, it's a very intriguing concept um, of of the runes, which I worked a lot with. Uh, but uh, it's not that it's either one system or another, because uh, you can uh, use them at the same time. And it gives you different uh, perspectives on uh, the runes, which uh, have so much uh, knowledge in, uh, inherent in themselves. Uh, yeah. So um, I sometimes myself work with other systems than Uthark, even if I'm, I'm personally very f fond of it. Yes. Kabbalah yeah. uh, is maybe my, my uh, at least uh, this far. Uh, uh, most important uh, book uh, because it describes the foundation of, uh, of Dragon Rouge uh, with the description of, of the Kabbalah and uh, a quite a detailed uh, uh, discussion uh, of uh, the view on, on the evil and the dark side and what it could be and uh, what's the consequences if we read uh, the Kabbalistic uh, uh, scriptures uh, fr from uh, 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 this other perspective, uh, uh, looking at uh, at the Kabbalistic writings uh, from the perspective of of uh, the serpent uh, 
in the Garden of Eden as a hero uh, rather than as the enemy of man. Right. Uh, so um, uh, it describes the foundation of uh, the initiatory system of Dragon Rouge and uh, and uh, the different uh, uh, cliffs and uh, and uh, dark squares that will lead uh, in the end uh, to uh, uh, man uh, becoming as the serpent of Eden promise uh, an illuminated uh, being a divine being uh, in and in the end the tree of knowledge will once again be combined with the tree of life. Right, okay. All right, um, so Thomas, um, you've also created uh, some really great paintings um, for um, Kabbalah, Cliff of Goetic Magic, and you've also made other paintings for some of other authors, some that will be releasing this year or next year and possibly beforehand as well. Um, can you tell me some of your views on art in the occult and maybe how these subtle forms of uh, communication help us to understand um, these large concepts like the black flame for once? Um, when it comes to the occult and uh, magic and uh, how to develop as uh, human beings and, and uh, spiritual beings, uh, words are of course of great value, but sometimes it's very hard to, to describe all the mysteries uh, with words, even if you write and write and write and publish a lot of books, because some of some parts of the mysteries are easier to, to um, illustrate uh, through music and, and the art. Right. And right. Uh, my interest in the occult have always been strongly connected to my interest in, in music and art and more or less all forms of, of artistic expressions. Yeah. I went yeah. to art school for one year for that reason before I started my more uh, typical academic career. But, but uh, art is for me uh, a way to work uh, uh, with seals, called seals in uh, the grimoire tradition, in the books of uh, magic, uh, has been a way to communicate with the spirits uh, and uh, you combine words, you combine uh, uh, incantations, invocations with the different seals and in that way um, art and the painting can be a way to create the communication with the spirit realm and with, with uh, the other side. Right. Um, so with that, um, is there anything else that you're working on that you could uh, talk about uh, right now at this point? Uh, my focus right now, besides uh, trying to be uh, a, a, a decent family father, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, uh, the next uh, edition of uh, Uthark. Okay. And, okay. and um, how we can see how different parts of, of the Nordic uh, myths and traditions correspond very well uh, with uh, the left hand path. So my focus will be to trace uh, aspects of the Nordic traditions that uh, haven't even uh, uh, symbolically uh, in the shadow. Okay. Uh, so my focus right now is more to, to look at the, the picture stones on Gotland and uh, also see how, how um, uh, things in our biology corresponds to myths and uh, to, to non-physical aspects of existence. Um, from an academic point of view, I'm, I'm a little bit on the same track, uh, studying uh, what's going on in the brain uh, during um, astral projections and, and, uh, and spiritual experiences. But I will look at that from my perspective as a historian and, and a, a, a scholar of religion. Right. Um, but with the with cooperation with, with the people working with, with the, the chemistry of the 
uh, brain and and uh, we can in that way give uh, knowledge to each other from our different perspectives. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Um, will, will you be doing any sort of um, do, in your since you're a teacher? But do you will you also be releasing academic papers on that? Yeah, it will be, be uh, some academic papers. Okay. Probably it uh, will will uh, be focused on on three uh, papers uh, that I will uh, release in the publication. Okay. Oh, interesting. Well, I look forward to reading that. <laughs> um, so, more uh, bringing it to um, more a personal level on on your journey in your life. Um, since you've been pretty much a practitioner your entire life. Um, can you tell us one or two things that kind of um, stood out for you as major learning points um, or realizations? Yeah. Uh, first, I would say when I realized that uh, I all my life have had uh, what happened been referred to as uh, paranormal uh, experiences. All my life astral projection has been very natural, but um, so natural that I didn't understand that, that people could uh, think of it as uh, something uh, something unnatural. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I was uh, 12, uh, I started to to read uh, a little bit uh, about the occult and realized that okay, this is something that uh, that uh, people consider to be, be uh, special. Even um, people feared some of these experiences uh, that I took for granted and uh, felt was very natural for me. So uh, when I was uh, around 12, uh, it was a very important. Uh, 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 part of my life when I realized, okay, what's natural for me is considered to be a cult. Right. right. The next important uh, part, uh, if I must mention uh, some, it's of course hard to, to, every minute is important in one way or another. Yeah. But it was when I went to, um, on a journey uh, with the goal of meeting the Dogon tribe in Mali, uh, which fascinated me a lot. It ended up with a, a very uh, weird uh, road movie-like journey down uh, through Europe, uh, <laughs> going to uh, uh, Morocco, and uh, ended up in uh, Marrakesh in, in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And um, I was told by a person there. I don't know still why or what it really was, but he came to me when I was sitting lonely at the cafe that uh, hi and introduced himself very briefly and then said to me, old temples will fall, new temples will be created, temples for the red dragon. When I came home from that journey, I made the decision to, uh, to uh, uh, create the order, Dragon Rouge. Right. Hmm. That's fascinating. That's a, <laughs> that's a big experience. I think uh, if you don't follow that, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a life wasted almost. <laughs> that seems... Uh, uh, for uh, sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is uh, also um, described in, in my book, uh, Amongst uh, Mystics and Magicians in Stockholm, yes. which of course is um, um, based upon uh, Alexandra David Nell's description of when he she went to to uh, Tibet, but uh, the idea uh, and the concept of the book is that you must travel. You must travel outside yourself uh, in different ways. Maybe travel around the world. Maybe travel beyond the, your body. But uh, at the same time, the maybe most important part is when you come back. To yourself from your starting point. Right, yeah, definitely. That, that is very true. Um, is it, um, with, I, I believe that uh, among uh, mystics and magicians in Stockholm, that's um, one part series? It's supposed to be a series of books? Is that correct? Yeah, it, 
yeah, but uh, right now I, I'm, it's actually because lack of time, but uh, I have to yeah. focus on some projects, uh, otherwise it can be, be like you're having uh, 10 different projects. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> started writing uh, part two and three, the part two will the, um, be about the early days of Dragon Rouge. Okay. Um, and the, it, uh, the project title is uh, uh, a necromancer's uh, diary, and uh, the the third part, uh, uh, the project title is uh, at the end of the left hand path, which is of course um, um, emphasizing the idea that the end of the left hand path is always a new start and the beginning. Right. Wow. I look forward to to seeing those books. Uh eventually now i know that uh, you are a busy man so it's a it's a hard thing to do but i do yeah. look forward to seeing those um it will come someday yeah <laughs> someday uh, um so um kind of coming back again also with uh kabbalah Klifoth, and goetic magic um you speak about um not, I'm not necessarily you personally, but more looking at um, the Jewish traditions and mysticisms of uh, what what evil is. Um, but could you give a little more of a definition that, of what you might think it is? Um, why do you think it's present or prevalent in, in society and religions, and why why is it such a big thing? That is an aspect of the left hand path which is important also for what we can do for society. Because if it's something we have learned from history, that it is never the people who think that they themselves uh, are evil or belonging to the dark side who make the most destructive things. It is always the people who believe that they do that for the sake of good and because they are good and they have God and they have, uh, have uh, the political uh, reasons uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, to, to force their ideas upon other people. So uh, if you look at this um, uh, from, from uh, the perspective of what we can also can do for society, if we uh, go uh, into deeper knowledge of what the myths are telling us and what the occult tradition are telling us, going into the concepts of evil and go into the concepts of, of uh, dark, uh, will make us uh, better humans. Maybe if you would use that ter term gooder humans and more enlightened humans because you don't uh, uh, just go for the cliches of what's good and uh, what's light. Uh, because most of the, the uh, really uh, terrible things that's happened through history has always been in the name of the good. And that's why uh, the myths and the occult tradition can teach us so much as human beings if we study the dark side. Great. So with that, it quickly comes to mind that um, what, what does the black flame um, mean for you? Um, what is your black flame? Um, now, I know this is kind of a broad term, but whatever you can give it is perfect. I would say the black flame, it's uh, Kundalini Shakti. It is uh, something that is deep inside us, the driving force, strongly connected to, to Shakti, to Kundalini, that uh, burn and transform. It's also connected to the rays of the black sun, which uh, nourish if we sacrifice what is bad, garbage in our lives, the black flame transform it into energy and into something, heat in the good way that uh, make it possible for us to, to live, to survive, to continue our journey. So uh, the black flame to me is strongly connected to Lilith, to Kali, to, to uh, heal in the Nordic tradition and uh, the, the left hand part uh, concept of uh, illumination. Right, right. Um, 
So um, we, we've already kind of spoken a bit about this, um, but uh, since you're, you're a family man, you're uh, a scholar, and <laughs> you're also a practitioner, so what does a kind of typical day look like for you, um, and how does that uh, help manifest your illumination? Quite typical day for me is uh, quite uh, looks quite much uh, the life of uh, anyone else with children, job, family, <laughs> etc. So um, I don't worship uh, Satan uh, twenty four hours. <laughs> um, uh, actually, um, I think it's. It, also important that that you must be able to live, uh, so to speak, normal life and make a normal career and focus upon things outside your occult practices because it also is good for your occult uh, practices. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, of course, uh, for some parts of your life, uh, isolate yourself from the world. world and practice uh, the, the magical arts all the time. But, um, but uh, at least uh, from uh, my interpretation and the interpretation of Dragon Rouge, uh, the left hand path is, uh, is far from escapism. Uh, you must uh, uh, go in, so to speak, both directions, uh, seeking for the unknown, seeking for the other side, uh, but also uh, uh, let the other side give uh, energy and knowledge uh, back to your, your um, uh, everyday life so that you can uh, be a, a person that, that uh, is, a, is a pillar and, and uh, that can, can help people on their road both uh, in the normal life and in the uh, spiritual life. Right. So my everyday, uh, uh, a typical day for me is uh, leaving and picking up uh, children at the preschool, uh, work, uh, sitting on, uh, waiting for, for a bus or uh, sitting in, uh, in a big city traffic, trying to read a little bit, swearing about uh, the traffic <laughs> and uh, drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> but uh, uh, some days I have the uh, possibility uh, and the privilege uh, to work in some of my temples, which I have home or a uh, Dragon Wish Stockholm temple, and uh, go deep inside uh, the, the, the magical work of, of uh, the draconian uh, current and tradition. Um, so, this is uh, our last question, um, or, or more just um, uh, giving you the, the, the stage. Um, but is there anything you'd like to say to um, our listeners, our viewers, uh, regarding Flambeau Noir um, and anything else that you ha might have? First of all, I'm very happy that this uh, this this uh, uh, this conference is continues and. Uh, I know how hard it is to organize, organize things in real life. There is a lot of people that that uh, just sitting and and uh, and uh, pretending to, to work with a cult. But you must also uh, show uh, with results uh, in real life that you, for example, can cooperate with other people uh, to to uh, prove for yourself. And for the spirits uh, that that uh, you have uh, learned something from your occult practices, and uh, that's the uh, Flambeau Noir, uh, a, a great example of, of uh, a, a concrete manifestation uh, of the occult into something that's also uh, uh, real on the physical uh, plane. And I look forward very much to meet meet. Uh, both the other speakers and artists and, and the audience. And uh, I think the left hand path should never 
go into this kind of um, dogmatic uh, discussions about what is true left hand path uh, and so on, because that's a dead end. It becomes like the bad sides of theology that uh, the left hand path is a mysterious path and we must just accept it and that uh, the, the mundane uh, definitions will differ and that's the beauty of it all. Right. right. Um, um, so is there, um, Ed, do you have any websites or social media that you'd like to um, uh, promote or were there where people could find you? I would recommend then uh, uh, the Dragon Rouge uh, uh, website, okay. which is, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think that's uh, dragonrouge.net. That, that's true. Okay. And uh, uh, it's also a good uh, uh, meeting point uh, with other uh, members and, and uh, people into the Dragonian current. Of course, it's for members. But, but uh, you will meet a lot of, of uh, very uh, skilled uh, magicians, uh, both uh, male and female, and from different backgrounds, uh, with, with the different um, uh, knowledges uh, and, and uh, professions uh, in, in the occult. So yeah, I think that's, that's the best way to, to, to start. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for for everyone else listening, um, please make sure to uh, check out uh, the Flambeau Noir website, which is flambeaunoir.com. Um, you can also check us out on Facebook by searching for Flambeau Noir. Um, and be sure to purchase your tickets. We have uh, more interviews coming this way, um, and uh, stay tuned for some more great announcements. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Yasin.